Marlin. Uh, this is You're Not Broken, as you can probably guess from the screen. So uh, I have a confession to make. This talk was not easy for me. And in fact, as m the minute I submitted it, I had this feeling of, oh God, what have I done? And I've spoken at GDC quite a bit, but it's always about facts and metrics and design principles. Uh, in fact, if you've gone to my GDC talks, any of them, you'll know that I don't even do a bio at the front because I hate talking about myself. So as I started getting ready and rehearsing this talk, and I was going through the slides, I got this sudden panic feeling that I'd be like three slides in and everyone would be like, oh my God, this lady's gonna talk about herself for an hour. And I started panicking because, you know, I, oh, I don't like talking about myself. So I actually made a metric for you about how much I'm gonna talk about myself, just so you know. <laughs> it's really just to illustrate what I'm gonna talk about, so you know that I'm coming from somewhere where I understand what everybody is going through. And so then I kept rehearsing, and I was like, oh, God, I'm going to be like five minutes in, and everyone's going to say, this is the most depressing shit I've ever heard, and everyone's going to run away. So then I worried about that. And I said to a friend of mine that preparing this GDC talk about how our creativity is affected by trauma and stress is giving me trauma and stress. <laughs> so here's where I ended up. I will pinky swear promise that I don't talk about myself any more than I have to to make my points. And that really it's not going to be depressing. In fact, it's quite the opposite. So stick with me through this beginning here. So a little bit about my road. I've been a game developer since 1994, largely in creative leadership roles. In fact, all in creative leadership roles. So lead designer, creative director, game director, VP of design, that sort of stuff. And a part of doing that in commercial game development means that you are effectively on the assembly line of creation. And I don't mean that in a demeaning way. It's not repetitive. Even making a sequel means making all sorts of new innovative design decisions. So it's not an assembly line from that perspective. But it is an assembly line from the perspective of you have to come into work every day and be reliably, predictably, effectively creative. That is your job. It's a predictable pattern. And in fact, it becomes the pattern of your life if your life is around making games like mine is. And so it's about shipping game after game, year after year. That's the pattern of your life. That's your road. But then in 2012, my road changed. I was diagnosed with stage four head and neck cancer. So side note, that little bit at the bottom there that says P16 positive, that means it's caused by the HPV virus. If you have kids, you have family of kids, you ever plan to have kids, you know any kids, get those kids vaccinated against HPV. Do not hesitate to do that. So, Suddenly, I'm on a road that feels a little bit different. It feels less certain. It feels darker. And my destination all of a sudden feels unclear. The rhythm of my life was totally disrupted. But as anyone who's dealt with cancer before knows, you immediately go into a different kind of pattern. <laughs> That was my radiation song. I listened to it every day when I drove to radiation for seven weeks. Uh, I had chemo every week along with that. That's the standard treatment for head and neck cancer. So seven weeks doesn't sound like a long time, but it takes like eight months to a year to recover from head and neck cancer treatment because it's one of the worst cancer treatments. The uh, combination of the chemo making you ill and the radiation to your esophagus means you literally can't eat. You have a stomach tube. You're on fentanyl patches. It's not great. So it takes a while to get over it. I worked from home during that time, and it seemed like it took forever. But I noticed something about my ability to work. And it wasn't just because sometimes I was sick. When I was working, and it was something about like planning or meetings or leadership stuff, I was largely OK. You know, I was a little slower than normal because I wasn't feeling well. I had to focus a little bit more, but it was normal, you know, mostly fine. But when it came up with or when it came to creative decisions, or creating a new story, or designing a new system. Nope. That assembly line, what, assembly line was not just broken, it was gone. It was an empty factory. That was it. And so there was this about six month period where I couldn't do what had really defined me for most of my life. And I started to wonder, did I, was I able to do this before? How was I able to do this? One of the things that was lucky in that circumstance was, I could hang it on something called chemo brain, which I'm going to talk about more in a minute. But it was a uh, principle uh, that was kind of new at the time I went through the first cancer 
for how chemo actually affected the brains of people going through it. So when you go through cancer, you go into that post-cancer cycle, regular scans every three months, every six months, then every year. Uh, if I got to the three-year mark without the cancer returning, it, there was a 99% chance it would never come back. So I'm crawling out of the hole, getting back to the pattern of my life, I'm back on the road again. And I hit that three-year mark. But they're learning more and more about HPV-related cancer all the time. So 2015, back again. This time it's in my lungs, stage 3B, very close to stage 4. So now this road is different again, especially since in my situation, I lost both grandfathers to lung cancer about two weeks apart. I had lost my uncle to lung cancer in 2012 when I was dealing with cancer, and my mom had died of lung cancer a year before. So this was not awesome, to say the least, and uh, you don't have much time to think about it because, you know, here we go again. So I was a rare case of going through primary chemo treatment twice. They don't usually do that. Uh, they did it in my case because they wanted to treat it as a new primary and because I was so young for a cancer patient. So here I am, going through chemo again, working from home again. This feels familiar. I know what this is like. Well, actually, I kind of didn't because it took me longer to recover this time, even though lung cancer treatment is way easier than uh, head and neck cancer treatment. And I was like, is it because I'm a, like three years older? Am I weaker because I went through this before? I just could not be creative. I couldn't do my job. I didn't feel like, like, my, my, like myself at all. And in fact, there's one moment that I'll never forget where, sorry if I get emotional, I sat on the couch and I said to my husband, I am a talentless hack and I meant it in that moment. And I thought I had always been a hack and I would always be a hack and I would never create ever again. And I meant it. So. Now I'm back in the cycle, right? You're doing the scans, I'm cancer free, I'm back on the road again. My road's changing every time I get back on it because I'm changing. But there was this moment of recognition where I thought, I've been here and I've come out of this and I'm coming out of it again and I'm learning something. And I wanna understand what it is that I'm learning because I'm a designer, I look for patterns, right? That's how I look at life. I want to understand this pattern. So six months in, it's back again. It's blooming in both lungs. And this time I get a special new word attached to it, which is incurable. So that's a new experience. And this is a totally new road. And unlike the other roads, I mean, it sure feels dark. But where it's different is I absolutely do know the destination of this one. Metastatic lung cancer returns after treatment. Not a lot you do, don't have a lot of time. So, spoiler alert, I'm not gonna die on stage, I promise you. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess the building could collapse or something. I'm not gonna die of cancer on stage, I promise. In fact, I feel really good about this month, this year, pretty much not gonna die this year. I feel great about next year too, pretty much. I'll be talking about that a little bit more at the end, but I didn't wanna do this whole thing with you feeling like I have death just like behind me with this scythe over the back of my neck, it's, it's not quite like that. So, all of this is happening as we in America go through a presidential election, which is super fun. So, I'm not gonna get political, but I will say, most of my friends were not pleased with the output of the election. And in fact, some of them were devastated. So it's the day after, literally the day after, and I'm on Facebook and Skype and Slack and Twitter, I'm talking about a way forward, I'm talking about the future, and I had a friend say to me, how is it possible that you are able to, to be like this? Because I know the, the election results wrecked you. How is it that you're able to do this? And I thought about it for a minute. And I said, honestly, well, I guess I've developed some tools for dealing with bad news. <laughs> and you know, I realized in that moment I had, right? And it wasn't just for dealing with bad news, it was navigational tools to help me find my way back to the person that I was, which is a creative person, to find my way back to the ability to be creative again. And so that's why I'm here, despite not liking to talk about myself, because I know I'm not alone. I've seen other developers try to power through hardship and personal tragedy, things like divorce, bankruptcy, long terms of unemployment, 
losing a spouse, losing a child, losing a parent. I've watched it damage and end careers. And it's not like what we do is not already hard enough. So when you take the stress that we're already under and you add that stress, and then you feel like you can't create, like you're completely blocked, and you blame yourself, you're crushing your own self-worth. And, and we don't need to do that to ourselves. We need to find a way forward. So I believe that so strongly that I'm up here talking about how I've learned to get through difficult times. I want to share what I've learned. And because you know I'm a designer and that's the way I look at the world, I've got steps. So I'm going to talk about the six steps that I found effective to get through difficult times and regain your creativity. So step number one. Recognize and acknowledge what's happening to you. So again, I had the advantage. Chemo brain, which by the second time I went through radiation and chemo, there were books about it because it was being recognized so much. Here are the symptoms of chemo brain. Things like being unusually disorganized, difficulty concentrating, finding the right word, learning new skills, multitasking. It's short attention span, short-term memory problems, taking longer than usual to complete routine tasks, trouble with verbal and visual memory. Do these sound familiar if you've been through a time of trauma? And in fact, the second time through, I'm a compulsive researcher, by the way, so I spend ridiculous hours researching cancer every time I go through it. So, and that's three times now, so a lot of research. So I liked this quote that I started seeing uh, when I was going through chemo the second time. For many sources of data, we now know patients experience impairments, not just after chemo, but after surgery, radiation, hormonal therapy, and other treatments. And I started thinking, maybe it's not just the treatment. Maybe the treatment makes it worse because you're sick. But maybe it's just exacerbating something that would happen anyway after you get diagnosed with cancer. Because getting diagnosed with cancer sucks, right? It's super traumatic. You have to tell your friends. You don't know what's going to happen. It's awful, right? So maybe, actually, it's not chemo brain. Maybe it's trauma brain, right? Maybe this is a common experience. And that's when I started thinking about all of my friends who had been through some of the triggers of emotional distress. So yeah, there I am under health. That's me. Uh, although, honestly, like everybody who's, who is, has lived, I've been through other things, right? Divorce, loss of a spouse, uh, loss of a, a child, loss of a parent, moving, uh, unemployment, all of these things, bankruptcy, having your house foreclosed, all of these things cause us distress. And when you're in those times of stress, you feel fundamentally lost and broken from a creative perspective because you can't set aside those strong emotions like fear and sadness and worry and anger. Those are the emotions that make us feel broken. If you feel broken, your creative work is broken. And so making great games and being creative means we have to make ourselves whole again. So I know it kind of sounds dumb when I say you have to recognize what's going on. And this is where you feel like, I don't have to recognize that my mom just died because my mom just died. I know that that happened. But that's not what I'm saying. Acknowledging the fact that something happened is not the same as acknowledging that it had a profound effect on you or understanding what that effect is. And in fact, we pride ourselves on being logical people in game development, but the nature of this situation that you're in robs you of your objectivity. So even the second time through, I didn't understand what was happening to me. Sitting on the couch, talentless hack, that was the second round of chemo, not the first. And even still, I didn't understand what was happening to me. We're all here because we have what it takes to make it in game development. It's a super competitive and demanding field. We got here by being tougher and stronger and pushing through. So we feel like we should be able to do that for all of our problems in life. And it's especially bad for us because our career is often the center of our life. We've learned that if we focus, we can shut everything else out if we focus on the problems we're trying to solve creatively. But trauma doesn't work that way. In fact, it's the opposite. Trauma completely robs you of the ability to focus on anything but the trauma. So if you look at these again, chemo brain, these are actually some signs that you're responding to a stressful situation. You need to be aware of these signs in yourself and recognize them when you see them. Other creative symptoms to be on the watch for, 
when your thoughts just don't flow. The, the blank sheet of paper is the worst anyway. I hate it. Uh, it's always a struggle. But when you're in this situation, you just can't. Like, you're just blocked. You're stopped. Um, and nothing seems to flow at all, except thinking about the terrible thing. That flows. Boy, that's all you can think about, and you can't stop it. I'm going to talk about that in a minute, how to stop it. But that is one of the main symptoms that no matter what you're doing, your brain just goes back to it. Another symptom, you're paralyzed. You can't make decisions. Any creative decision feels like the hardest decision you've ever had to make in your life. And as soon as you can bring yourself to make one, it's the most worst mistake you ever made. And you immediately want to take it back. You have no confidence in any decisions that you make. And finally, imposter syndrome. The worst imposter syndrome ever. Where you're not just convinced that right now you suck. You always suck. You will ever suck. You sucked when you were born. You're just the worst person on earth. And absolutely, you're going to feel that way in that moment. So when these things are happening, you need to recognize it. You need to recognize the words coming out of your mouth and the thoughts in your head. Things like, I can't get started or I can't focus. Being in the middle of working on something and going, wait, what was I thinking about? Because your mind has been back on whatever you're going through emotionally. Things like, I'm just too tired to do this. Or I'm ashamed to ask this question to say, to admit that I can't, I can't finish this by myself. Or it never used to take me this long. These are the signs that you're responding to this thing that you're going through. And you need to know, it's not you. Really, it is not you. And here's why it's not you. I'm going to talk for a few minutes about what creates a state in which you can be creative based on some studies. So first, if you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it's super obvious. There's creativity way at the top of the pyramid. The stuff that I'm talking about that's disruptive traumatic events in your life, all the way at the bottom of the pyramid. Like, I'm down there in physiological at this point, uh, but most cancer treatment is there in safety, safety of your body and mortality. Uh, employment is in there. Family is in there. Property is in there, right? So if you have that low layer of the pyramid completely disrupted, how do you expect the top of the pyramid to be normal? So when you look at studies about what makes people more able to be creative and more effectively creative, you see things like this, sleep. So everybody knows getting good regular sleep makes you more productive. But a study at Harvard Medical School showed that students who were asked to solve a creative problem before they went to sleep performed better, solved the problem better and faster than students who did not think about it before they went to sleep. Regular sleep aids your creativity and it aids your problem solving. And sleep is the first thing to go when you're going through the situation, as everybody knows. It's absolutely the first thing that goes. Daydreaming. So studies have shown that regular daydreaming, leaving the task at hand mentally for a moment and thinking about something else, actually helps you solve the problems. It keeps you creative. And the best way I can describe that is, I'm sure everybody in this room has been stuck on something for days and solved it driving or showering or planning a vacation, right? That's because releasing your, the main part of your brain from dwelling on it is letting another part of your brain solve it. When you're in situations that are traumatic and difficult, you don't daydream. Anytime your mind wanders off a task, it's back. I have to, oh, I'm going to have to sell my mom's house. I'm going to have to go through all her stuff. Oh my god, I forgot to contact this person I need to contact. That's all you can think about. Collaboration is a big part of creativity, being able to bounce your ideas off of other people. When you're going through these situations, you're often alone. The situation requires it. You're in court for the divorce. You're traveling for the family's death. You're home for chemo. But also, you just don't feel like talking to people. So even when you're at work, you hold yourself up at your desk or your cube or in your office. You eat your lunch at your desk. You're just not talking to people or collaborating the way that you used to. And here's an obvious one. Sunshine, not just for vitamin D, though. A 2002 study found that high school students were, who were asked to design murals that were later judged by independent critics were more highly rated if they created outdoors in the sunshine versus students who created indoors with no sunshine. And when you're going through something like a divorce or a cancer treatment or the death of a loved one, how often do you go out in the sun? Pretty much not at all. Safety. 
The concept of feeling safe in your creative environment is important. If you've watched on Cleese's creativity talk, it's a part of that. Uh, you feel so profoundly unsafe when you're going through this, especially since you are so critical of your own ideas. You don't feel safe talking about those ideas to anybody else. Again, no, it sounds obvious, but happiness. There's actually a study that linked students who were thinking happier thoughts with the ability to also create new ideas more easily. The very fact that we're unhappy inhibits our creativity. And finally, habit. People underestimate the amount that habit affects our creativity. There's a reason that my opening was talking about the assembly line of creativity, because it is a habit. We don't think about it that way. We think about it as our jobs. But every day when you go up and you perform the rituals to go to work and you do your job, that is a habit that you have formed around creativity. And you can forget how to be creative. So here is something just to make the point of how you can forget things. So when you're going through head and neck cancer treatment, which is also why I have to drink so much, you take so much radiation to your esophagus that you can't swallow. So you have a stomach tube for nutrition. So your doctor tells you, but you absolutely positively have to swallow at least a sip of water a couple times a day. Because if you don't, your body will forget how to swallow. And I'm not kidding. If you don't do that, you have to go into special physical, physical therapy for them to teach you how to swallow. And some patients fail and can never swallow again their whole lives because they spent four months not swallowing. So if your body can forget how to swallow, your brain can certainly forget how to be creative when you break those habits. Having creative habits, having habits that support creativity, make you more productive and they make you more creative. So when I say acknowledge what you're going through and how it affects you, I mean acknowledge that it's breaking this cycle. It is breaking all of the things that you took for granted as a part of your life and didn't even understand were feeding your creativity. So in those moments, it's not you. You feel broken and it's not your fault. You are the way you are because of what you're going through. You can't shake it off. It's gonna be with you for a while. You have to acknowledge that this is affecting you in deep ways and whatever it is, you have to just take it and deal with it, which is what I'm gonna be talking about in a minute. And a small side note, it's never too late to retroactively realize that you were going through this. Because as creative people, we carry all of our failures with us all the time. We remember our terrible decisions, we remember all the mistakes we made, all the things we were wrong about, that's how we grow as creators, right? So we don't take the same bad shot again. If you take a bad shot once, you're like, I remember, that sucked, I'm gonna do a different one this time, right? That's why we grow. If you failed at a time when you were going through something like this, forgive yourself. Don't carry that as a failure, because it's not your fault. You don't need to have that on your list of failures. If there's any failure there, it was a failure for you to understand what you were going through and how it affected you. So that was step one. So once you understand what you're going through and you can kind of figure it out, the next step is to find ways to center your thoughts. And I've said this to people in the past who are going through stuff, and it seems impossible. I get it. I totally get that it seems impossible. Um, so. It's tons of, I know it's possible though, because when you are told you have incurable cancer and you're laying in bed at night in the dark, what are you thinking about? You're thinking about, is it growing inside me? Where is it growing? Is it gonna be in my esophagus? Is it gonna stop me from breathing? Is it gonna hurt? When is it gonna kill me? How soon is it gonna kill me? Who haven't I told it that it's gonna kill me, right? So if I can learn to stop that, anybody can learn to stop their thoughts. So I'm gonna talk about how I did that. But the one thing I do wanna mention is that even if you think you can distract yourself, unless you can learn to control and still your thoughts, your unconscious mind is still working on it. You have not succeeded. And trying to be creative with your subconscious mind working on it is like trying to be creative during this. Oops, that's weird, my video didn't play. It was an auctioneer belting out uh, an auction of a cow. 
and trying to be creative over the yammering voice of an auctioneer. And you do need to tell me. Here, nine minutes and thirty-eight, and eight, nine, and nine forty. Here, nine minutes and forty. One minute and two, nine minutes and two, two minutes and here and three. Now four, forty, four minutes and here and five. Here, nine minutes and forty-six. Here and five and a half, six at forty-six. <laughs> so that's what your brain's doing the whole time you're trying to create. And yeah, you need to t tell it to shut the fuck up, right? You need the tools to be able to do that. So here's what I did. So going through the first cancer, I could not sleep. So that's priority one, because if you're tired, you're just effed. You've got to be able to sleep. So what I did that helped was relaxation recordings. Uh, the kind I used is by a guy named Andrew Johnson. They're on the iOS store and Android store and the web. Uh, there are dozens of other options. And like many things I'm going to mention in this talk, they run the whole gamut from super practical, like listen to nature sounds, all the way to super fruity, like here's your horoscope and let's talk about a mystical journey you're going to take to your past lives, right? So whatever, wherever you are on that scale, whatever you think is bullshit or not bullshit, there's something for you. So if you see a whole bunch that you're like, I want something to talk, someone to talk to me about God, not talk to me about, you know, nature sounds, there's something for you. And if you think that's bullshit, there's something for you too. So don't be discouraged by what you see when you first start. So every night, I would go to sleep every night listening to this. And initially, it was great because having the voice gave me something to focus on instead of my own thoughts. But over time, I trained my brain that when I heard this, I would get sleepy. Hi, I'm Andrew Johnson. Take some time now to make sure that you're sitting comfortably. Put your feet on the floor. Put your hands on your lap. Take a nice, gentle, deep breath in. And out. And just allow your eyes to close. Just allow your eyes to gently close. Take your mind on a little journey, down through your body, down through your legs. I get sleepy if you're listening to it now, still, because I was trained that that means it's time to sleep, and that's what you want to do. This is about training. You hear this all the time. It's true. Meditation helps. I'm a gadget nerd. I had a biofeedback device called Wild Divine. I think they may be out of business now, but if you look up Wild Divine, I think they have a Kickstarter for some new gadget that's similar. But there are other biofeedback devices for uh, meditation that are out there. It helped me not just because I'm a nerd, but because I was able to have something tell me when I was in the correct physical state, which meant I could return to that physical state. I actually learned to lower my blood pressure by thinking about lowering my blood pressure and clearing my thoughts. So it can be a very powerful tool. Uh, I signed up for Headspace. It's an online program for meditation. It has a great trial. You can try to see if you like it. It's about building the habit of meditation through small sessions at first and longer sessions. I found that guided meditation was way better because when you're trying to deal with something difficult, if you give more than about two minutes of silence, you just, your brain goes back to it again. You need someone to, to train you to control that. I also really like Budify because it has little bitty meditations for different times of the day that are about what you're doing at the time, like walking to work or taking a break from work or taking a break in the evening before you sleep. As soon as they came out with the Breathe app for the watch, I got it and programmed it for every hour. So every hour, my watch would buzz and remind me to close my eyes and breathe for a minute. And unless I was in a meeting, I absolutely did that. So there's lots of these options. You need to find the ones that work for you. But it's important to do it, to find something that gets you to sleep and to find things that help you, train you to, to clear your thoughts. So something else will help, that helped me, because I'm a giant nerd, is a productivity method I'd studied called getting things done. So a part of the theory of getting things done is that it, you have all this time in your brain, this giant list of things that you don't want to forget that you need to do. And some of them you do at work, and some are things you have to do at home, and some are things you have to do the weekend, and some are things you have to do next time at your mom's house. And your brain is always worrying about all of that because it doesn't want to forget it. So you make lists based on when something is relevant. So you have the list of things I'm going to do at mom's house and the list of things I'm going to do at home when I get home tonight and the list of things I'm going to do over the weekend. 
And the important part of this is you're training your brain. Because uh, over time, your brain actually learns, hey, if I put that list or that thing on the list of stuff I want to do at mom's house, and then I do it when I get to mom's house, my brain learns to stop worrying about it as soon as it gets on the list. So I made lists. And as dumb as it sounds, I was doing a whole bunch of research at the time, and researching cancer is thinking about cancer all the time. So I would book my research times and not let myself research except for that time. And over time, I stopped thinking about it, or I thought about it less, because I knew there was a time later that I would be thinking about it. And I actually developed my own visualization technique based on this. So picture that you are floating on a screen on your back, moving along with the current. Take whatever it is that you can't stop thinking about, that you're worried about, but you can't do anything about, and mentally bundle it into a bundle. And visualize yourself taking that bundle and setting it down in the stream beside you. You can see it moving with you on the stream because it's in the current, just like you're in the current. And that means it's going to travel with you. If you get stuck in the reeds, it's going to be stuck in the reeds. You don't have to carry it because it's going to be there. You can let it go and visualize it floating away from you. Let it go. And I found that helped me a lot too. So whatever works for you, whatever it is, you need to find those tools that let you still your thoughts so you can be in control of them again. So here's the next step. Then you need to start going beyond yourself. So I am a hermit. Like, I'm not even kidding. I don't go to speaker parties. If I, there's a party I'm obligated to go to, I'm the one in the corner with, for the least amount of time, immediately leaving as soon as I possibly can. So it sounded fine that I would be working from home during chemo because I would be immunocompromised. But it's so isolating. And we forget how much connection with other people is what fuels our creativity. Those of us who have worked out of offices and then worked from home know that the effect that it has on your creativity. So you need to find ways to incorporate other people. You can start with the people around you, friends and family. And more important, you can enlist them in helping you with the first three things on the list. Like my boyfriend would see me, would glance at my computer screen and see it was uh, cancer research studies and tell me to stop because he knew that I wanted to think about cancer less. I have another friend who, when I would be talking on Slack with her about, I just can't solve this problem, I'm super stuck, I feel so stupid, she would say, how much have you eaten today? Because when I was going through chemo, it would get to be four or five at night and I would have had nothing, literally nothing to eat. And she knew that affected me and she would tell me to eat. So enlist your friends with the signs. Have, let them help you because they want to. Therapy is a huge help. And if you're a therapy skeptic, for whatever reason, you need to think about it differently when you're going through a traumatic period. You see a podiatrist when there's a thing on your foot. There's a thing on your heart. And you need to see a specialist about it. And you don't need to be shy about it or feel weird about it. So I didn't get therapy for my first two cancer uh, sessions, but incurable, yeah. I went to a specialist who deals with people who have cancer. And when people talk about therapy, they usually talk about how good it is to unburden. But honestly, it's a two-way street, at least for me, and maybe that's just a part of who I am. For me, it was super helpful having someone who doesn't know me tell me it's not my fault. It was helpful to hear someone who's dealt with a bunch of people in this exact situation tell me, everybody goes through this. Of course you're going through this. This is normal. Because hearing that from a husband or friend, of course they say that. They, you feel like they have to say that, right? Hearing it from somebody who's a professional is different. You can find online resources. I mean, obviously vet them and make sure you're comfortable with them. Uh, but there are lots of online resources for whatever you're going through. So for me, it was Cancer Survivors Network Forum for my first cancer, because they had a really good uh, head and neck cancer forum, but their lung cancer forum isn't great. So I found a different one, which was called Inspire, and went there through lung cancer and then immunotherapy, which I'm in right now. Twitter, Facebook, whatever it is, find a community of people that you can trust and talk to who are going through the same thing. And then you'll find the other way that I found really helped me which is helping other people. So 
the act of talking about what you're going through with people going through something similar doesn't just help you, it helps them. And then it circles back around and helps you again. Because saying to somebody else, oh, I know exactly how that feels and it's not your fault. I went through that same thing and I couldn't work for a week when I was going through this stage of chemo. You're telling yourself that too. You're telling yourself that it's okay. And actually helping people even going through something different. Telling that person at the office who didn't finish something because he was up all night with his kid because they're going through a divorce. Telling him it's okay, God, that sucks, I'm so sorry. Don't worry about it, of course you couldn't finish it. Is reinforcing to you that what you're going through is important and maybe it's okay that you couldn't finish something too, right? Helping other people helps you. Now the big question is, how much do you wanna tell other people that you know or publicly about whatever you're going through? And that's an individual decision. So I'm speaking here only from my own perspective. Everybody has to make this decision for yourself. I talked about every cancer publicly, I had a blog. I talked about it on Twitter. I really thought before I talked about incurable cancer on Twitter because I was like, who is ever going to hire me again if I say I have incurable cancer? Which, if you think about it, sounds like a problem that's gonna solve itself, doesn't it? But, turns out, I did have to interview after talking to people about incurable cancer. It's not the end of the world. And in fact, the more you talk about what you're going through, the more you shine a light on it. The more it stops being a dark secret, the more it stops being the thing that you're trying to hide, the more it stops being a negative, and the more it starts to become just a part of who you are. So, step number five, four. You need to find low pressure creative outlets. So if you remember this, you've forgotten. You've broken your patterns, but you don't wanna launch back into something super complicated again because you're just gonna be doubting yourself. It's not gonna be a pleasant experience. If you're trying to continue to work while you're going through whatever it is, you know how hard it is every day. You don't need to bring that home too. But what I am saying is, if you can find small creative activities that are low pressure and not associated with your day job, you can start to get that part of your brain firing away again in a non-judgmental way. So here are a couple of things that I did. Rock band. So rock band is awesome, but rock band is also magic because rock band makes you feel like you're creative and you're really not being creative at all, right? <laughs> but you feel like you are. That's the magic and the design of rock band. Uh, karaoke has a little bit that there's something just really special about rock band. So you and yourself with rock band and a guitar controller or a microphone in a room, even though, and you are being judged because you're being scored, but we're all game developers. So we look at that and we're like, oh, okay, I know I just need to push these buttons better. And you still feel creative. So it's a great, sounds strange, but it's a great first step toward feeling you can be free and like you can express yourself again. Coloring books. Coloring books are actually great. I had a friend mail me a whole bundle of them and it was fantastic. Uh, and uh, I remember there was a period of time where I was fucking paralyzed over picking a color. Like literally paralyzed. Chief creative officer of a major third party developer and I was paralyzed picking a color for a coloring book. These Getting in this creative situation again is hard. You need to find little ways, right? And I picked a color and it was okay. And that was a part of the journey back to being creative again. I also really like Zentangles. So Zentangles, you can buy a kit on Amazon or look up how to do them, but basically you have a card of a fixed size, you divide the card into segments, and then fill the segments with pattern. And you don't invent the pattern there, that you copy them. Uh, and you can even roll the dice for what pattern goes where. So it can be zero creative decisions when you start it. But you do it in ink. No do-overs, you're committing. And over time, as you do it, both the ritual of drawing the pattern is therapeutic, but over time you'll find yourself starting to make creative choices, like, ah, I think that pattern should be a little bit bigger, or I like that one better. So it's another good thing on the road. But whatever you find, you need to find little things not connected with your work, where you can have a judgment-free environment to start being creative again. So then, once you've done all of those things, you're ready for step five, which you are gonna plan your escape. Say we get into the cage and, and through the security doors there and down the elevator we can't move and past the guards with the guns and into the vault we can't open. Without being seen by the cameras. Oh yeah, sorry, I forgot to mention that. Yeah, well, say we do all that. Uh, 
We're just supposed to walk out of there with $150 million in cash on us without getting stopped? Yeah. Oh. Okay. So you're going to go on the creativity heist. And it's a specific plan. Uh, so remember these things, the things that contribute to creativity, you're going to use those to take your brain back. So here's how you're going to do it. Step one, you're going to make sure you can sleep every night. Nothing else matters until you can sleep every night for a week. And whatever you find to let you sleep every night, you keep doing it. Like, until you feel like you don't need to do it anymore. And if you ever relapse and can't sleep, you start doing it again. And nothing moves until you can sleep. As soon as you can do that, you find ways to take breaks to daydream. If you have to force it, you make yourself plan into your next vacation. You make yourself look at childhood videos or photos. You make yourself play a game that's nothing like the game that you're making. You find ways to disconnect during the day. Next, you reach out to other people. You find a way to connect to other people and talk to them about what you're going through. All of these are mandatory. You can figure out how to do it. It can be anonymous, but you need to find a way to talk to people about what you're going through. You're going to get some fucking sunshine. You're going to come out of wherever you are. You're going to sit by a window. You're going to sit at a park bench. You're going to find a way to get some sunshine at least once a day. You're going to make sure you have a safe space to create. Sometimes that means like your uh, coworkers. Sometimes it means only some of your coworkers. Sometimes it means finding one person that you trust, and bouncing your ideas off of that person first. Hey, can you read this doc? You need somewhere that feels safe for you to take those first creative steps so you're not doing it in front of your whole normal audience. And then you're going to gather things around you that make you happy, even if it feels artificial at first. When I was walking to work every day after chemo, the second chemo, I had a Spotify playlist called Walking, you know, inventive, and it was happy music by God, and I listened to it every day, and it didn't matter how I felt. That was the playlist I listened to when I walked to work because it framed me for the day. And so you're going to do these. You're not just going to do them. You're going to schedule these things. You are building habits through doing this. That's the whole point is to build new habits, to rebuild those habits that you lost. So one good way to do that is journaling. There are a lot of different journals, again. This is one called the Dragon Tree Journal that um, has like life rituals and stuff like that in it. Again, these run the whole gamut from the journal of, have you slept? What did you eat? Did you exercise today? Which, by the way, exercise is a great way to get that sunlight. Going all the way from that, though, again, to the, the side of, Let's talk about Zen. Let's talk about gratitude. Let's talk about past lives, right? So wherever you are on that spectrum, there's a journal that's going to work for you. So you just have to look for the one that's right. But the point is, there are planners that are not around work, but are around goals and personal life. So find one of these. Fill it out. Write about your experiences. There's actually evidence showing that journaling every day becomes a key part of creativity. It unlocks part of your brain. It encourages you to solve problems. So what you are doing here is you are rebuilding habits. You are starting the assembly line up again. And it's going to be crazy and wacky and feel disconnected. But over time, it's the way that you get back to yourself again. It's the way that you get back to predictable creativity, which is what makes you feel like yourself again, if you're anyone like me. So now you've gone through all of these steps. And once you're doing that reliably, and you feel like you have started to get back onto the assembly line again, it's time for the last one, which honestly is just to endure. Uh, when I was going through both cancer treatments, especially the second one, I had a lot of friends and, and people tell me, you're such a warrior, you're so brave. And I was like, eh. Those are the warriors, the doctors that saved my life. Those are the warriors. Me, eh, I kind of just took it, right? I just waited it out. That's really what I did. I just sat it out and waited for it to pass. 
right, waited for things to change. I mean, certainly, now I know to take a more active role in recovering my creativity, but when it comes to whatever you're going through, all you can do is endure it, is wait it out. So there's this interesting study on creativity from the Georgia Institute of Technology that showed that whether you brood over negative things or actively reflect on them helps determine, quote, whether you slump into depression or jump into creativity. Now, I am not saying that you need to look at your trauma positively. If somebody told me I didn't need to look positively at uh, incurable cancer, I'd probably punch them in the face. So I am not saying that at all. If it sucks, it sucks. And you need to be honest about it sucking. But I do believe there's a little bit of a choice there. I do believe that we can choose to reflect on what's happened. Like I can stand up here and talk to you about the fact that, yeah, this cancer is probably going to kill me. And that's OK, right? Because I reflect on what that means. I've thought about it. I'm not carrying it around like something I'm brooding on. I'm reflecting on it. There is a choice. And what I'm saying, though, is that you can also think about the things that you're gaining in going through the bullshit, like wisdom and perspective and resilience, because you are gaining things. And that's what you reflect on, because you're not just enduring. When you look at it, all of these steps have that recognition, that sense of awareness, that sense of pondering built into them. You're not just enduring, you're enduring and you're growing. So when you start radiation treatment, you get a tattoo. You can actually, with this shirt, you can kind of see it. It's so they can place the equipment reliably every day when you're laying on the table. So every day for three years, I'd look in the mirror after showering, and there's my, my, little, my little beauty mark I never had before. And I don't think that it's a coincidence that I would wake up every morning and look at that dot. And it was the first time after 20 years in the industry that I talked about being a woman in game development. And I don't think it's a coincidence that I would look at that dot every morning and write for Gama Sutra about diversity. I don't think it's a coincidence that at this point, I look at two dots because I needed a second one for, uh, for lung cancer. I don't think it's a coincidence that I look at those every morning and I'm here talking to you. The things that we go through change us. And they can change us in good ways and bad ways. I have lots of side effects, and that's OK. But they change us. So I said I'd circle back around to Mr. Death here and exactly where his scythe is positioned at the moment. So I went into a clinical trial. I'm the second one on the left. Uh, <laughs> it combines two immunotherapy agents. Uh, it was phase one when I went in it about a year and a half ago. I don't, I don't know if it's even phase two yet. It might be going into phase two. So uh, in June of last year, they released the first results at a, uh, one of the big cancer conferences. So in previously treated patients with SCCHN, which has had neck cancer, uh, the combined ORR was 23%. That's objective response rate. Believe it or not, 23% is high for immunotherapy. That means 23% of the patients responded to it. They had one CR and six PRs. A PR means a partial response. It means your tumor shrank or stayed the same, which is a victory in metastatic incurable cancer because it means they're not growing and killing you. They had one complete response, meaning the cancer is gone. That was me. I was that one response. <laughs> Science for the win. So I still have incurable cancer. This cancer probably is going to kill me feel pretty good it's not going to be this year, based on other things in the study. feel pretty good about next year, too. But I also feel like the luckiest person on the face of the earth. I should not be standing here right now, right? So I get scans every two months. It could mutate any time. Still, luckiest person ever. And when I first responded to the trial, it took a while to sink in. I am on the road again. Hey. I need to care about stuff I didn't think I needed to care about, right? I had a will. I was ready. And now I'm like, oh, I guess I should finish my car payments, <laughs> right? So, but what I've learned, though, in going through this is that we're all on the open road, all of us. Every minute we're alive, we're on the open road. And the thing I want to tell you is I'm nothing special. 
I'm a game developer, just like you are. And I went through some shit. Everybody goes through some shit. It's really not special. I endured, and I grew, and I changed, and so will you. And I've learned that no matter what was going on, I wasn't broken. I'm not broken. None of you are broken. No matter what's happening to you, you're not broken. You're growing. All of us are growing. So uh, I have a few minutes for questions. Sorry. But I know what it's like to not want to talk about stuff in front of people. Hi. So my DMs are open on Twitter if anyone wants to ask any questions privately or talk. So thank you. Any questions if anyone's feeling brave? And it's okay if there aren't any, because, uh, yeah. Yes, there's a microphone, actually, sorry, I should have mentioned that. There's a microphone in the center, which makes it worse, sorry. <laughs> now you don't just have to ask this question, you have to actually get up and move and then talk loud, so sorry. I just didn't want to make people wait for me to walk around. Um, so. I live with an invisible illness, and one thing that I struggle with is going a really long time between jobs. Yes. Um, and it's very hard sometimes to interview with someone and say, hey, I was out of the industry for two years because I was undergoing really severe treatment, um, but I'm fine now and I can work really well, yay! Uh, how do you deal with those gaps, or how do you talk about those gaps when you interview? Yeah, so uh, super fun uh, making the decision that you're going to look for a new job when you've talked about having incurable cancer in public. That was awesome. Uh, Ray of Hope, not talking about it publicly yet, but I got a new job. So it's not impossible. You actually can do it. Uh, the, thing that I, it's, the thing that makes it tricky, honestly, in that situation is the law as well. So secretly, I'm a lawyer. Uh, I did that before I was a game designer. So I, I unfortunately have to put that hat on occasionally, whether I want to or not. So this is my lawyer hat, even though I'm not giving you legal advice. <laughs> That's the problem, right, is yeah. you don't want to talk about a disability in an interview. When I was interviewing for the role that I'm taking, uh, I actually didn't say any, I mean, it's not hard to figure out. You read my Twitter. I mean, obviously, when I started looking for a job, I stopped talking about it briefly. But just look at my Twitter. I mean, it's not super hard to figure that out about me. But uh, I didn't talk about it until uh, they gave me the offer. And I said, by the way, I need to know that it's OK that I'm going to have to fly to Los Angeles, because it's in Seattle. I'm going to have to fly to Los Angeles one day every two weeks for the trial treatment. Non-negotiable. So I think it is tough. I think I'm going to tell you what my boyfriend told me. And I'm going to try to say it without crying. If they're the kind of company that you can't be honest with, you don't want to fucking work for them anyway. If you can't be who you are, and they want to support you in that, and they think these things make you better, and these things make you awesome, then you don't want to work for them anyway. So that would be my advice to you. Thank you so much. Yes. Um, hello. Uh, you mentioned how you're very open when it comes to talking about your cancer, and how it's up to everyone to make that decision for themselves, whether or not, or how open they want to be when it comes to talking about what they're going through. What would you recommend for someone who wants to be a lot more open about what they're going through, but finds it really, really scary and difficult to do that? Oh, yeah, I mean, that's uh, holy crap. Uh, hi. Uh, I don't, I mean, I'm the worst case scenario, because I'm super private, and I really am a hermit. I mean, I had to get over it to be a creative lead, so in my job, I'm not a hermit at all. But you give me any, as soon as I get home from work, I am like locked in a closet. So I think, What I found helpful, honestly, one of the hardest things about being diagnosed with cancer is telling everybody who loves you. Super rough, right? And I actually started to understand the widening circles of who you tell things to when at different times. It's interesting when you think about it, right? Like, these are the people I have to tell first. These are the people I have to tell second. These are the people I can tell on Facebook, right? And all of those people should hear before I say it on Twitter. But honestly, for me, Talking about it on Twitter was the easiest. 
because they, I don't have a personal relationship with a lot of the people there, right? Anybody on Twitter that I have a personal relationship with already knew. It was so removed from everything, and at least from my Twitter community, so supportive, that I found that easier. I also found it easier to blog, because it was me telling people, like typing my thoughts, and then posting the blog to Twitter or to Facebook, right? I found that that really helped. Um, one of the main things you have to, at least for me, that was a problem was, I didn't want people to look at me like I was in any way diminished or feel sorry for me, right? That's why my spoiler alert, I'm not gonna die, was at the front of this, right? I don't want people looking at me that way. So that's what I would say is find some way to talk about it that you can share with a little bit of distance to kind of get yourself used to it. Cool, thank you so much. You're welcome. Yes. Hi. Um, sometimes you go through uh, a trauma, right? And uh, it's, it's a bad event, um, and there's a long healing process. But um, the nature of random events in life is that sometimes you get a bad run, and you clearly have. Um, how do you um, talk to the people around you um, who, who see that you're struggling, right? Um, because there's tons of good advice here for how to try to find a way out yourself. Um, but it's a complicated dynamic system to be in relationship to a lot of people who love you and want you to succeed and know that you can do better than you're doing right now. Um, and to... Uh, yeah, really struggle not only with that internal uh, sense of, of worthlessness or, or diminishment, um, but also uh, with not wanting to disappoint the people who are trying to help you get out of it, right? Um, did you find any resources about how to communicate with those folks? Yeah, so what I'd recommend, even if you're not dealing with cancer, is that you Google uh, what not to say to people who have cancer. <laughs> People say some pretty amazing things to people who have cancer. Luckily, I didn't have a lot of that, but it's, it's wacky. But what I learned in looking at that was that you just need to be honest, right? Sometimes not in the moment. If somebody says something to you or is trying to help in a way that's not actually helpful or is not helping when you feel like they should, um, let that moment go. And at a more neutral time, you need to be honest. Uh, I was forced into that when I went into the incurable cancer because I said to my boyfriend, uh, about some of his relatives. I said, uh, I do not want a single post about broccoli curing cancer or, right, <laughs> to take this special Chinese herb and just get that out, right? I do enough research that if there's something that is anti-cancer, I know about it, probably, but I don't want any of that mystical crap when I'm trying to go through this. And I just, you just have to be honest. If you can't be honest, find a loved one who can. Again, get that distance from yourself. Don't, when you're in these situations, the last thing you need is to take more burden on yourself. You, you already have enough. So find a loved one, like me enlisting my boyfriend to tell you know, his relatives that. Find a loved one who maybe can have that conversation for you. But you really just have to be honest because... The, and the other thing I'll say, as difficult as to say, is if there's someone that's poisonous and difficult, just get, get them out. That's it, done, cut it. You don't need it. It's not helping you. Um, you don't owe them anything other than... Uh, you know, maybe a reason for why you're cutting them out. But uh, that's what I would say, is you just have to be honest and tell people what you need. They, they, they can't guess unless, even if they've been through what you've been through, been through they honestly just can't guess. Sure, thanks. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. So my entire family has this concept of just let it go. Some familiar to Frozen. I'm sure everyone has heard that song by now. Um, but... I have always struggled with the concept of how to let it go. Like I always feel like there's this just demon on my shoulder that's just constantly whispering doubt and just terrible things about me that I know are not true. Yep. How do you get it to either shut up or to feed the feed the angel, I'll say? So it's those steps. The first the first step is stilling your mind. You need to be able to control your thoughts. At this point, I can actually stop thinking about dying, right? I will find myself going online and researching. I research the trial that I'm on pretty often, and I will find myself going to look at statistics, and then I'll be like, no, nope, I am not doing that. You just have to build the tools. But the thing is, it's not willpower. 
It's not a failure in you that you can't do it. It's training. It is exercise for your brain. You need to think about it that way. Uh, I also recommend CBT therapy. A lot of what I'm talking about in this actually is CBT therapy. I have my undergrad with psychology. And again, I don't, I'm not qualified to practice it. But I can say that repeating the same exercise will train your brain. And the first exercise is not to train yourself uh, that those thoughts are bad, but to train yourself to control your thoughts at all. So uh, meditation, things like that, that's what's going to get you to the point that you can start to control those thoughts. Thank you. Uh-huh. Yes. Hi. Uh, so first of all, thank you. You're welcome. So I just wanted to ask, you know, I'm kind of struggling with, you know, I'm having been unemployed for a few months, and I get into this weird feedback loop where, you know, I'll have anxiety over this unemployment, then I'll feel guilty because, like, oh, another one of my friends has been unemployed for longer and they're putting on a good face. And then that makes me feel more guilty, which yep. makes me for, feel more anxious. Like, oh my God, they're dealing with this so much better than You're me. You're talking I'm about the more section pleasant. that I deleted from my talk because I didn't have enough time. Which I had a, a video of John Oliver talking about whataboutism because you're whataboutizing yourself. You're whataboutizing yourself, right? So I went through all this radiation uh, and have been wondering, where is my superpower? Right? Because I get, I got, I've gotten so many scans. I get CT scans with radioactive contrast every two months. Right? So where is, my C, where is my superpower? And I realized that my superpower is to make anyone who's complaining to me about anything shut up when they remember I have incurable cancer. Right? <laughs> no one wants to talk to me about any problem ever. Right? Because they're comparing. You can't compare. Everyone goes through things like this uniquely. Your experience is unique from someone else's. You cannot compare because everything that's happened in your life has combined to make you unique from someone else. You have things in your past that might make what you're going through easier or harder than someone else going through the exact same thing. I absolutely know that it's my design background and my objectivity that enables me to stand up here and talk about this stuff so objectively, right? I'm trained for it. Other people couldn't do that. So you need to not compare yourself. You need to tell other people not to compare you need to acknowledge what they're going through, right? So let's talk about being unemployed together. Let's talk about what we're doing together. When you say something, I mean, you can acknowledge it and say, uh, so you, if you're complaining about being unemployed, you can say, yeah, I know it's been even longer for you. Mm -hmm. Put it on the table, it's a fact. Don't feel guilty about it, just acknowledge it. But don't, what about yourself? It's not helping anybody. So I think I'm out of time. And I think you're also the last question. Oh. Did, did you want to have a follow-up? We can talk after. Because oh, no. uh, I can also, I'll go to the, the follow-up area. So, okay, everybody. Thank you.